Dr. Uh, William Stewart, uh, coming to us uh, live from uh, Lady Smith, British Columbia this morning. And uh, we are very grateful to have uh, uh, presenter uh, of, um, of your stature, uh, Dr. Stewart. Uh, uh, the, the book you wrote on the Psalm, uh, Canadians on the Psalm, is a topic that uh, was long overdue in being explored. And today, uh, I understand you're going to present to us a little bit about the Battle of Arras and uh, another uh, welcome topic for us. And uh, we are very grateful that, uh, to have you with us today. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to our association, uh, Dr. William Stewart. Thank you very much, Glenn, for, the, uh, for that introduction. And uh, so let me just get my presentation fired up here. I'm hoping everyone can see it. All right, I think we, I think we got it. Good. Great. Okay, so I'm here to talk about the Second Battle of Arras. Arthur Curry, commander of the Canadian Corps, called this the Corps' hardest battle. He thought it a greater victory than Amiens. And I'm going to argue that it was the most important operational assignment the Canadians received in the First World War. But as a battle, it gets buried in the larger narrative of 100 days. Most of the attention is on Amiens. I want to elevate its uh, stature and, and give you a better sense of what the, what the battle was about and why it was important. So I'm going to start with what was the context for the battle, look at the terrain, the defenses, and then break the battle down day by day. It's a uh, nine-day day, nine day battle running from 26th of August to 3rd of September 1918. In between each day's account, I'm going to intersperse 12 factors that were critical to either hindering or helping the Corps in its operations. I'll tie it up with what were the results were, but another interesting aspect of this battle is that it was fought over the exact same ground as first Arras. So I'm going to do a quick uh, comparison between what happened at first Arras and second Arras and take a look at what happened between 1917 and 1918. Now, with apologies to Dave, I am not going to spend much of any attention on the two British divisions that served in the Canadian Corps in this battle, the 51st Highland and the 4th British. Uh, I simply just don't have the time and space, but suffice it to say, they performed surprisingly well given the hindrances and limitations that they were operating under. So, right. Okay, so the operational context. So on the 8th of August, the Canadian Corps, part of a larger set of formations, uh, inflicted what the Germans called the Black Day of the German Army on the 8th of August. But as was the want of all First World, World War I battles, uh, the offensive bogged down and the Canadians were moved back to the Arras sector. And Douglas Haig, commander in chief of the British Expeditionary Force, uh, moved the spearhead of the British Army to Julian Bing's Third Army, initially striking towards Beaupont, but then he shifted the attack to break through the Hindenburg Line and that red line you see in the center of your screen, the drocourt quiot Line, or what the Germans called the Wodan Switch. This was the archstone of German defenses in the Western Front, and if that was knocked out, that would have incalculable effects. However, Bing moved slowly, and Haig was very concerned the Germans would do the rational thing and fall back to the Hindenburg Line. So on the 24th of August, he changed, uh, informed the Canadians they're being given a new assignment. They were to strike 27 kilometers from the outskirts of Arras, uh, cut their way through six separate defensive zones, cross the Canal du Nord and receive uh, and capture high ground overlooking Cambrai and in doing so smashing that um, centerpiece. And this is why it's such an important battle, more important than Vimy, more important than Bachardale, more important than Amiens. It could have important operational consequences if the Canadians succeeded. So this is the terrain over which most, of, well, all of the battle was fought. And what the Canadians were going to have to do is that red line and even further. So as you can see, there's a lot of terrain, there's a lot of defenses, there's a lot of defenders that the Canadians are going to have to fight their way through. And as in all battles, the terrain shapes what occurs. 
So the first consideration are the heights of ground. There is a uh, Orange Hill, Chapel Hill, and most importantly, Monchy La Prue. And I think as uh, Glenn could probably attest, when you're standing on top of that hill, it is striking how far you can see in every direction. It is an incredibly powerful observation platform. Now, the Canadians were going to have to fight their way through a whole series of ridge lines, each one a little bit lower than the preceding one, but these were also bisected by a series of rivers. There's the Kojal and the Sensei rivers. Now, these are, uh, let's be clear, little more than muddy ditches. You can step across it in August with one stride, but they have deep banks, which makes them impossible for cavalry, horses, and vehicles to cross. And then to the far, uh, right of your screen to the far east is the Canal du Nord. It's partially flooded and it is a significant military obstacle. The other important factor were the defenses the Canadians were gonna to have to contend with. So uh, south of the Canadian uh, sector was the Hindenburg Line, which meant that the British 6th and later 17th Corps were going to have to hack their way along the uh, Hindenburg Line to keep up with the Canadians, something they were not eager to do. Canadians were going to face first the Fushi Wankor Line, and this was a famous line that uh, involved a lot of heavy fighting in uh, uh, first harass. There is the German main battle zone line, which was designed to protect Mangy La Prue. Then there was the uh, British and German front lines from the end of First Arras to March 1918 when the British fell back from Mangy La Prue. This is a deep zone of trenches, uh, barbed wire, strong points. Behind it is the Friend Ravoy line, another strong line, somewhat stronger south of the uh, uh, Arras Cambrai Road. And there's a switch line in the Vison Artois that links it to the DQ line or the Drocourt Quillant line. This is the one that the Canadians were most concerned about. Built on the same principles as the Hindenburg line, it featured in concrete emplacements that were impervious to anything lighter than an eight inch shell, protected by thick belts of barbed wire up to 30 meters thick and multiple trench lines. And there were concerns that some of these trench lines were linked by tunnels. So both the British and Canadians regarded this as an incredibly strong position. So once the Canadians break through that, cross the Canal du Nord, there's the Marcoin line. So six lines they're going to have to uh, defeat. So it's a very different situation than Amiens, where once you broke through that uh, initial crust that the Germans had built, there were no real fixed defenses until you reached the old Somme battlefield. So here it's line after line, zone after zone after zone. There are no green fields until the end of the battle. So let's get to the battle itself. And it breaks down into three phases. The first starts off very successfully, and then you start getting very mixed and diminishing returns. So the situation is uh, Curry has three divisions. And so the 51st Highland is off the map at the top. And I won't be talking about them. There's the third and second divisions. And so the objective initially is to reach approximately this green line. But they were not to stop there. They were to continue as far east as they could possibly go. The defenders consisted of the 214th and 39th Infantry Divisions. The 214th had been in line for over two months, was exhausted, and the division commander had requested permission to have it relieved. He was turned down. Behind them was the 26th Reserve Division, two regiments. This was a Württemberg unit and is in fact an elite formation, really hard fighters. Moving up was the 35th Infantry Divisions. The Germans thought the, the attack was gonna take place north of the Scarp River, the top of the screen. So it was on the wrong side of the river and it would have to uh, hurry, uh, hustle down to get into position. So it would not reach the battlefield to the late morning of the 26th. So the Canadian plan was to attack at 3 a.m. It uh, was supposed to be bright, uh, uh, full moon. However, it was cloudy and rainy, so uh, it was really dark conditions to uh, start the fight. So the initial stage was the 8th Brigade attack on a narrow front, uh, punched a hole in the German lines, and then rolled the Germans up as they, uh, they advanced to the south. Canadian accounts are really clear that the Germans were firing at phantoms to the front, not recognizing the threat that was looming up on their flank. To the south, the second division attacked with two brigades. 
The Sixth Brigade had this similar issue or a similar solution to their problem where they attacked on a narrow front. The Canadians didn't have enough field artillery to be able to attack through their entire front. So the sixth attacked on a fairly narrow thousand meter front, struck east and then rolled south. And in the process destroyed a German battalion at Nouvelle Vitasse. The German regimental history talks of the battalion commander pleading with his superiors to be allowed to retreat and the word arriving too late with the result, most of the battalion was killed or captured. So this is now early or sorry, late morning on the 26th. The seventh brigade is going to resume the offensive. They take Monchy Le Preau and then st start striking down infantry uh, hill. But they start encountering advanced elements of the 35th and the attack gets bogged down. There's such a complex set of defenses in this area that uh, even small numbers of Germans would be able to slow them down. So the 35th division is given the task of driving the Canadians back and retaking Monchy Le Preux, that, that a very important observation advantage. So they send in two regiments. And unfortunately, uh, they didn't attack to the late afternoon with uh, two regiments, each with two battalions. By that point, the Canadians were tied in with their artillery and the attack was cut to ribbons. One regiment, in fact, was so badly battered, it would not fight very well for the rest of the battle. And this is going to be a theme that you're going to see running through German counterattacks arriving late and not accomplishing much. To the south, the 4th and 6th brigades attacked again and were able to reach that green line. Two battalions of the 6th brigade attacked for 27 straight hours. Really an amazing performance. There was nothing wrong with the infantry in the 2nd division. There were issues with the high command and we'll talk about that. So one of the factors that was a major difference between 1917 and 1918 was tempo. The time it took between attacks. So in 1917 at Passchendaele, attacks were four, seven, and four days apart. Here, we're talking hours. And the result is, is that the Corps cannot provide detailed orders, planning, intelligence, uh, practice sessions. You have orders that, that used to be 30 pages are now 18 lines. They fit on a single message pad. Responsibility is pushed down to divisions and lower. That means abbreviated battle procedures. It also had the impact of somewhat ragged coordination. The Corps wasn't managing its divisions really tightly. As a result, there's a very discordant nature. And where this shows up, uh, at least in this battle, is the third division attacks five hours before the second division. Both divisions had agreed to attack at 455. The second couldn't get off its line till 10 in the, uh, in the morning. A large part is that the second division did not get open warfare training uh, before Amiens. The first, third, and fourth did, and the second is sluggish. It is just a really slow division. So situation on the 27th, the objective is to take initially the friend Ravoy line, but the Corps wants the DQ line, the big, the, the, the major threat captured as well. It's a very, very aggressive stance that uh, Curry is uh, adopting. The defenders consist of the 35th and 26th reserve with remnants of the 39th at the front. The 214th division has vanished. It is no longer combat effective. So the attack starts with the third division at 455, two regiment, or sorry, two brigades attacking. The seventh, uh, under a weak barrage, is unable to make a lot of progress. The ninth hits that weak regiment I mentioned that was battered in its counterattack, uh, and it was able to make more ground, but not, not the important ground that the Canadians needed. Uh, the 35th is a very aggressive division. They launched two more battalion level attacks. And although they were ultimately defeated, they didn't suffer quite as badly as they did on the 26th. To the south, the second division attacks at 10. It overruns the 39th. It's removed from battle. In fact, the division commander is tasked with writing a very detailed explanation of why his division did as poorly as it did. So the Canadians reach the Sansa River, they stop and then resume the offensive in the uh, early afternoon, but without any artillery support. They are met by the Württembergers of the 26th Reserve Division who cut them to shreds. The attack is a pretty much complete failure. And as you can see uh, where the line ends up. 
So much less success than on the first day of the offensive. So at this point, Curry has a critical decision to make. Does he, um, the, the second division suffered pretty heavy casualties. The third is tired. Does he pause the offensive or does he have it continue? He decides it must go on, which in retrospect is clearly a mistake. So the situation in this case is we've got the 35th division and 26th reserve division. The idea again is we're going to take the friend Ravoy line and we're going to take the DQ line. What's being overlooked is that behind each one of these divisions is two more German divisions. So it would be a very difficult prospect to be successful. Commander of the third division, uh, Major General Lipset, who's a British officer, decides he's going to change the tactics of what, how he's going to uh, approach the attack. He's attacking on a frontage that a British division would defend. So he can't attack across the whole front. He's going to do a series of sequential brigade level attacks supported by all of the division artillery, concentrated artillery fire with smoke. And so he launches starting at seven, then at 10, and then at 1230, and the friend Ravroy line falls. He is able, they are able to capture it. Uh, Ludendorff, the de facto head of the uh, German army, is so outraged at the 35th Division's performance, he calls up army headquarters demanding von Kremnitz's head. That was the commander of the 35th Division. And I think somewhat unfairly, the division fought well. It was just uh, overwhelmed by a much better division than it was. To the south, the 4th and 5th Division, or Brigade, sorry, were going to attack the division commander, Burstall, decided that he's going to use a weak barrage, no smoke. The division did not like using smoke in part because it did not have that opportunity for open warfare training. The attack goes in again against the um, 26th Reserve Division and it is a comprehensive defeat. The 5th Brigade suffers very heavily. Three of its four battalion commanders are killed or wounded. One is evacuated sick uh, three days later. The 22nd Battalion marches out of the battle with 40 men led by a regimental medical officer. The second division is done in. It is not capable of further offensive action. So this gives us where the final line is. So you have success above the Aras Cambrai Road, failure below. So one of the themes I want to talk about then is command success and errors. So in the case of Lipset's third division, his uh, solution of sequential attacks based on his belief the Germans could not switch their artillery quickly enough turned out to be the right plan. So the concentration uh, or the combination, sorry, of a concentrated barrage of smoke was a very powerful weapon. And we'll talk more about that uh, as we go along. On the other hand, you've got Major General Burstall, 2nd Division. He's wildly optimistic before the battle. He was telling the commander of the 1st Division how far his division was going to advance. He leaves in the 5th Brigade when it is clearly pretty much finished. He attacks on a broad front with a weak barrage against a cracked German formation. They don't use smoke, and the attack is late. And not surprisingly, it fails. Now, I don't want to leave Curry out of this. I just don't have time to get into uh, the various aspects of uh, the errors that were made during the battle. Certainly, the attack on the 28th has to be considered one of the worst decisions that he made. So at this stage, uh, the two divisions are done. They're replaced by the 4th British and the 1st Canadian. So we entered phase two of the operation. I'm calling it nibbling, and we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll figure that out pretty quickly why I'm calling it that. So two more themes I want to talk about. One is congestion. So the uh, road system that the Canadians were using was uh, very poorly serviced by roads. The railhead was on the wrong side of Arras. Uh, Canadian road discipline was very poor with the result that there was just congestion everywhere. So on the 29th of August, the 1st Division Artillery received no um, ammunition supplies, no shells. So they couldn't attack. So that as a result, there was a need to pause. And this is where one of the secret weapons the Canadians had was their tramways uh, service. We're able to push light rail far enough uh, from Arras that it could get the offensive uh, to resume. And as a result, the Canadians were able to attack every day but one in this offensive, in part because of the tramway system. Uh, on the 2nd of uh, September, the big attack on the DQ line 
All of the field artillery fired by the first division was supplied by the tramways. This was a very powerful weapon in the Canadian system, which leads us to another issue, and that's communications. Now, while they were better than they were in 16 and 17, they are still fragile and unreliable. You have instances where brigades attacks are delayed by hours because the communication line was cut or battalions receive a cancellation for an attack five minutes before they were supposed to jump the bags where the battalion next to them got that order six hours before. They're also very uneven. Battalions knew what was going on. Corps knew what was going on thanks to their core survey section with observers along the front line where they could report by wireless back to Corps headquarters. They also had uh, contact patrols by the RAF. The result was brigades and divisions didn't really know what was going on. They were behind the power curve quite a, quite a bit as a result. Okay, so why did I call it nibbling? Well, what the Canadian Corps had to do is they had to reach this black line. It's the jump off line to attack the DQ line. There are two reasons for this. They had to get close enough that the infantry did not have a long advance to reach the German position, but they also needed to be close enough that the field artillery could fire through the entire depth of the DQ position, and it was a deep position. So the Corps is going to have to do is that the course of the next three days is get close enough to that jump off line that it's a feasible operation, but do so without destroying the only two divisions that Curry has available, the 4th British and the 1st Canadian. The 4th is moving up, but it's not going to arrive until uh, one day before the DQ attack. So it's these two units that are going to have to make it happen. To the north, uh, I'm sorry, the defenders consist of the 26th Reserve Division. It's still in place. It's been reinforced by the uh, lamentable 4th Ursas Division, not a crack unit by any means. And then below, uh, below them is the two regiments of the 111th Infantry Division. So the British attack in the morning, they make some progress. There's toing and froing, but they are able to make some advance. So in the front of the 1st Division, the intent is to capture uh, the Vies and Artois switch and the southern portion of the Friend Revoy line that's still uncaptured. So the commander of the 1st Division, Billy Griesbach, decides he's going to do things differently. Rather than a broad front attack, he's going to send a single battalion to strike at the junction of the uh, Friend Revoy line and the Vies and Artois switch to attract the Germans' attention, while he rolls two, re uh, two battalions to strike uh, up against the um, uh, and outflank the, the, the German trench positions. And this is exactly what happens. So the third battalion attacks on a narrow front, thick barrage, smoke, and they break through. It tracks the Germans' attention. And we have uh, German accounts from the battle, company level commanders reporting that they, they had defeated two Canadian frontal attacks. The Canadians didn't attack frontally. Instead, they rolled out out of the mist and the company commanders then reported that out of the mist came uh, Lewis gun teams firing from the hip. Their positions are overrun. They have to make a decision, stand and die or run and uh, bolt. Uh, the two battalions of the 26th Reserve Division that were hit uh, were reduced to 50 men each. The two battalions of the 4th Ursatz Division vanished. It was a spectacular victory for the 1st Brigade. But as much as I like to say, hey, great victory, go Canada, that's not the end of the story. So this is the, the, the line that was reached uh, in, the, in the morning. So Griesbach sets up his defensive position, that red dashed line you see on the screen. Now, some of you may notice, uh, well, what about the uh, ground around Upton Wood? There doesn't seem to be much there. Well, good observation because Griesbach leaves two platoons to guard that 2000 meter sector. Germans move up the 16th Infantry Division. That's the counterattack division. It is full strength. And notice there are some full strength German formations here. Two regiments are sent crashing in to that open flank. They obliterate the two platoons. They crack and break some Canadian units that flee. Canadian officers have to pull out their, uh, their pistols from their holsters to rally the troops, but they slow the Germans, they stop them. And then over the course of the rest of the afternoon, drive the Germans back. This is the perfect German counterattack opportunity, a wide open flank, two fresh regiments smashing into this 
defenseless zone and they are stopped and comprehensively defeated. One of the regiments is so battered that when it's attacked again two days later, it collapses uh, almost immediately. So what this really uh, highlights are two important themes that run through this battle, and that is the importance of the field artillery barrage. There were 83 battalion level attacks made by the Canadian Corps in this battle, that's Canadian and British. If the concentration of guns was less than 30 meters and a lower number is better, there was a 97% success rate. It's important to know that these barrages are only used when the defenses are the strongest and defenders are the strongest. So that is an amazing amount of success. So field barrage with smoke, 97% success rate. No barrage, 33% failure rate. All of which says is that when you can conduct a proper barrage, you got a really good opportunity for success. The other is the Canadian infiltration tactics. So in the conditions where there's mist or night or smoke, uh, you could defeat the German mesh machine gun defensive uh, positions. So the Germans would have, in a sense, a mesh of machine gun posts that covered each other. And so you'd have to defeat the whole mesh in order to advance. But with smoke, most of those can't see what's going on. So you could isolate and then annihilate the German uh, strong points. And this is very potent, according to the Germans both accounts uh, during the period and after the war, there's a consistent story of the Germans are bravely defeating the Canadians, advancing on them directly, and then out of the smoke comes grenades, machine gun fire, rifle grenades, and their position is overrun, and everyone has to run for their life. And this is like a consistent pattern. So uh, in the right conditions, these infiltration tactics could be devastatingly effective. So now we're in the 31st, so the second day of the days of nibbling, or nibbling. Defenders now, the 26th Reserve Division has now been swept from the field. It's no longer combat effective. The 4th Ursatz moves up. There's the 16th Infantry Division to the south. Behind the 4th Ursatz, the 2nd Guards Reserve Division. Now, you might think, oh, that's got to be a really good unit. Well, in fact, it is uh, very poor. One of its regiments, the 91st Reserve Infantry Regiment, consist of two reinforced companies. Regimental commanders told his uh, superiors, this unit will fold as soon as the enemy attacks. They are left in line, showing how desperate the Germans were. So the plan is uh, for the British to continue their advance, which they do, uh, getting closer to the dotted line. The second brigade strikes uh, northeast, rolls up the remaining portions of the friend Ravoy line, tries to get even closer, but doesn't succeed. The Germans move up reinforcements. So this is the uh, situation as it, it is at the end of the 31st. So there's one day before the attack, Canadians are going to have to get to that dotted line. So two more points I want to mention. One is there is a stunning lack of coordination between the British, that is both on the flanks and within the Corps between the 51st Highland and the 4th British. Uh, attacks take place a couple hours uh, out of sync, like there's seemingly no communication between them that maybe you, know, you could attack at the same time. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, a certain amount of ill will the Canadians have towards uh, some of their British counterparts. There's a consistent pattern of uh, Canadian reports back saying the British really don't know their business. Uh, in some cases, they were right. In some cases, I think they're just uh, maybe exaggerating a little bit. The other dimension is the powerful organization of the Canadian Corps. A Canadian division's ration strength was 50% larger than a British division. And that's why when I mentioned the British did surprisingly well given uh, some of the handicaps, they were so much smaller and weaker, relatively few casualties rendered a battalion combat ineffective, whereas the Canadians could just keep pounding and keep pounding. Canadians had the advantage of three battalions of engineers per division, which meant the Canadian infantry did not have to provide working parties. British did. And then there's a plethora of ancillary units. I've mentioned the tramways, the uh, core survey section. They had more signalers, more gunners, more uh, machine gunners, more truckers, more of it, just about everything. And as a result, the Canadians were able to perform at a much higher level, in part because of this organizational advantage. All right, so last day, 4th Division now comes into place. It uh, takes over part of the front from the 1st and 4th Divisions. It's at this point, the 4th British Division Commander, Major General Matheson, has to report to Curry that one of his brigades is no longer fit for battle. 
So it's now down to two brigades. The fourth is going to have to shuffle its plans. And instead of attacking on a one brigade front, it's going to have to attack on a two brigade front when it hits the TQ line. Defenders are the same set of characters as before. The fourth makes some progress. In the morning, the second and third brigades attack. In the case of the third brigade, they overrun one of those regiments I mentioned that had been badly battered on the 30th. And uh, you know the Canadians are capturing machine guns with covers still on the guns. The uh, unit just broke and ran, basically. Uh, this is unacceptable to the German high command. Uh, the order that an immediate counterattack be launched. So the 29th uh, Regiment of the 16th Division is thrown against the 2nd Brigade, and they have some success. They drive back the 7th Battalion almost back to its start line, but the 7th slows, stops, and then drives back the Germans without any reinforcement. So again, here's an indication of an attack that should have been successful, fails. Uh, Another attack is made late morning or late afternoon, sorry. The uh, third reserve division sends in the 34th Fusilier and 49th Reserve Infantry Regiments. And these units, because they're attacking so late, there is so much artillery available to the Canadians that they suffer terrible losses and disorganization that puts them in a really bad situation for the attack the next morning. So this brings up and highlights German errors. So the commander of the 2nd Bavarian Corps, which was the Canadians faced, was General de Army Conrad Kraft von Delmensingen. He was a star of the Bavarian Army. He was chief of staff of the Bavarian Army before the war. He commanded the crack Alpen Corps during the Romanian campaign, where it won great uh, victories. He was the chief of staff of the German army that broke the Italians at Carporetto. So a right, uh, very, very good offensive general. He stumbles in uh, the March offensive. Uh, the attack on Arras is badly handled, and he, in effect, gets demoted to commanding the Second Bavarian Corps. So I just want to give a brief outline of the German defensive scheme to understand what uh, Delmensingen was trying to accomplish. So the German defenses consisted of three zones. There was a forward zone or a Vorfeld, the idea being that that acts as a shock absorber. It, uh, it inflicts casualties and disorganization on the attackers and they are slowed down. A combination of interlocking machine gun fire and field artillery fire weakens the attackers so that when they reach the main battle zone, they can be stopped, at which point counterattacking divisions carefully in place and reserved from the rear zone can come crashing into the attackers and throw them back. It doesn't work here. And there's a couple of reasons why. First, the German field artillery instead of covering the Vorfeld, is moved back to covering only the battle zone because they had lost so many guns at Amiens and during the French Second Marne Offensive that the decision was we can't expose as many guns as we had in the past. But that reduced a lot of the firepower of um, the Vorfeld, making it far less effective. And throughout the battle, Delmensingen is continually trying to push the Canadians back to retain and uh, retake the Vorfeld to make sure that he's got enough of that uh, buffer. So the attacks on the 26th, the attacks on the 27th, on the 30th, and on the uh, 1st were all designed to push the Canadians back to retake the Vorfeld. But these counterattacks failed over and over again, even when they had uh, of the perfect situation, like on the 30th. Um, there are 12 uh, well-attested counterattacks that match in both Canadian and German records. And in those, three quarters failed. And the one quarter that succeeded were all single battalion attacks against British units that had no significant effect on the battle. So in effect, the Germans were throwing their reserves away, exposing them to the power of Canadian artillery machine gun fire for no, no gain. So now, third phase the DQ line, the big kahuna. So situation is, is that the plan is the Canadians will attack at five in the morning and they will advance to this red line. The expectation is, is that the big battle is going to be for the DQ line. The Canadians know that Germans have decided this is their, their winter line. They're not falling back. So the expectation is that the Germans are gonna pack as many troops into this position as possible. And uh, if you defeat the Germans at the DQ line, it's green fields. There are no real defenses other than the Boosie switch until you reach the canal, at which point 
Um, the attack would resume at eight o'clock and eventually by the end of the day, the Canadians have reached the heights overlooking Burloyne, a very, very aggressive plan. The fenders consist of, uh, we're familiar with most of these, the one unit you haven't seen is the First Guards Reserve Division. Unlike the second, it is a crack unit. It is at almost full strength and uh, it is going to present a major, major obstacle. So the attack opens at five. The fourth division uh, reaches most of its objectives. It has some pretty hard fighting to do so, suffers fairly heavy casualties, but it, it accomplishes its objective. Uh, the fourth attacks with two brigades supported by tanks, barrage, smoke, excellent fighting tactics, and they suffer casualties, but they do take the, the, uh, the DQ line. Uh, much easier than was they expected. What they found was the line wasn't as formidable as was thought. Uh, it hadn't been well maintained. Some of the trenches had fallen in. Some of the concrete emplacements hadn't been finished. But more importantly, the defenders, the 4th Ersatz and 2nd Guards Reserve Division weren't fighting to the end. Uh, so they were able to, to be successful. To the south, the 1st Division attacks with the 2nd and 3rd Brigades. They again attack on a narrow front, concentrated barrage, the first is attacking on a frontage that a British division would defend. So they don't have a very high concentration or density of forces. So they attack on the narrow front and then roll up the Germans. And there's an account from uh, one of the regiments of the 111th uh, Division that there was a clearing in the smoke and the regimental headquarters could see one of their battalion headquarters being surrounded and mauled by tanks and Canadian platoons. And there was nothing they could do about it before the fog and smoke closed in and uh, battalion headquarters ceased to exist. So eight o'clock now, uh, DQ line has fallen. It should be a pursuit phase from now on. It isn't. What happens is both the 4th British and 4th Canadian are pretty badly battered by the 1st Guards Reserve Division, deployed in depth uh, with this mesh of machine guns, trench mortars, artillery firing over open sites, and the Canadian infantry just cannot advance. They have no support of a barrage. There had never been a plan. The expectation is a pursuit phase. It turns out to be a very different kind of battle. And the 4th Division suffered so heavily, it had more fatal casualties in a day and a half of fighting than the other three Canadian divisions had in three days of fighting. So you can see the extent of the, uh, the, 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 the sense the massacre. Another part that tends to get some attention in the historiography is uh, Raymond Brutenell's Canadian Independent Force. This was a conglomeration of uh, motorized machine gunners, cavalry, cyclists, artillery, trench mortars, signaling troops. The idea is that they're going to race down the Arras Cambrai Road, seize crossings over the Canal du Nord at Marcoin at the lower end of your map, and then hold the bridgehead until the Canadian infantry arrived. Well, they barely got to the red line they suffered a fraction of the casualties that units on each side of them did, and they accomplished virtually nothing. It was a very, very weak performance. To the south, the second and third brigades, after a lot of very hard fighting, were able to capture the Boosie switch, but were in no shape to advance. One battalion of the second brigade, the 10th battalion, took 15 hours of constant fighting to reach its objective. The, the brigade commander thought it would have taken them two hours. Uh, and this was not a function that the 10th didn't fight well. They fought amazingly well. It was just a really bad plan on the part of the second brigade commander. So the situation at the end of the day is as follows. The first division after three days of intense fighting is exhausted. They're incapable of any offensive action. The 4th British is likewise exhausted and pretty much shattered. The 4th is a disorganized mass mess. Uh, there is some discussion about making an attack in the morning, but uh, all of the people in the field were able to persuade their superiors. It's just not happening. The German situation, however, is of all the divisions that were on the front line, all of them are destroyed. They're, none of them are combat effective. It's only the First Guards Reserve Division that's still in relatively good shape. Two more divisions joined during the day, the 12th and the 20th, but they're not strong enough to hold the defenses uh, without any fixed defenses. So overnight, the Germans retreat over the Canal du Nord. It takes the Canadians a lot of hours to realize they spend the rest of the day slowly advancing to the canal. The offensive effectively is over. But what this 
German retreat causes is a retreat on uh, two army front back across the canal and into the Hindenburg defenses. So a very significant result. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. So two last themes I want to mention is one of the factors that contributed to the nature of the battle on the second. And, and in fact, through the entire second harass, the Canadians didn't have enough troops. According to GHQ doctrine, they had a quarter to half of the doctrine of the amount of manpower they should have had. They had two thirds the concentration of artillery of the third and fourth armies, and only 12% of the battalion attacks were there sufficient tanks to match GHQ doctrine. So the Canadians are fighting with one arm tied behind their back. And they ultimately, even though Hay keeps telling the Canadians, you're the spearhead, he refuses to provide them with the resources to achieve what he wants achieved, which I think is an indictment of Haig's understanding of what it takes to be successful. The other factor is the Canadians, like the British, simply didn't have enough infantry firepower. They had a lot more, and they were a lot better than they were in 16 and 17. But when you face defenses like the First Guards Reserve Division deployed 500 to 800 meters in depth. Uh, you don't, and you, the, your Lewis guns can maybe reach out 250 meters, a grenade 40 meters, maybe rifle grenade 80 meters with some accuracy. You are not going to be able to advance against that kind of firepower. Now, each Canadian battalion is supposed to have a uh, battery of machine guns attached. However, if they show up, if they have enough ammunition, Canadian machine gun uh, doctrine is not very, very good on the offensive side. They don't provide much in the way of value. Trench mortars would be an incredibly powerful uh, adjunct to uh, infantry battalions, but uh, they can fire all the ammunition they can carry in one minute. So they don't tend to be of much use. Field artillery typically is suction, two guns that's attached to each uh, battalion. If they show up, if they are supplied, they can do good work but they can't do area suppression, which is absolutely necessary. They can take out point targets, but when you have more point targets than you can count, they're not gonna make a lot of progress. So as a result, Canadians simply didn't have sufficient firepower. They needed the barrage in order to advance. So results, what do we get out of this? So I'm gonna do as a comparison to Amiens, the more famous victory. Uh, Amiens was seven versus nine days, four active days at Amiens versus seven. Casualties, uh, much more at Arras, uh, 11, 12,000 Amiens, 17,500 at Arras, but on a per day of active operations, Arras, or, sorry, Amiens is actually larger. More prisoners are taken at Arras. Uh, more guns are taken at Amiens in, in large part because the Germans pulled them out of the way. They didn't want them to get captured but they lost a lot of firepower as a result. More machine guns are uh, taken at Amiens. And the advance is uh, almost the same. And we consider the, the advantages the Canadians had Amiens. They had massive tank support. They had an elite Australian Corps on their flank. They're facing Germans that are completely surprised and exhausted. Uh, there are very few in the way of immediate German reserves available. Uh, the defenses consist of a thin crust of extemporized defenses, not six, or in this case, five lines of uh, established defenses. So you contrast that, you can see why uh, Curry thought the Arras victory was a greater one than Amiens. So another dimension of looking at this is to take a look at 17 versus 18, first versus second Arras. So this was this portion of the battlefield south of where the Canadians attacked on Vimy Ridge. And that was the, the main thrust of the British offensive was north and south of the Scarp River with the Third Army. So when we take a look at the uh, results, I think this is a picture actually of Vies and Artois in 1919. So you can see there's not much left. So first Arras was a uh, battle lasted 39 days versus nine for second Arras. So it's four times longer. The British had two times more divisions in the front line than did the Canadians. The Germans had the same number of divisions, albeit a little bit weaker, but the divisions in 1918 had a lot more machine guns. Uh, first Arras had 75% more field artillery pieces, 65% more heavy artillery pieces, and a throw weight advantage of 2.6 times. All of which is to say, 
first harass a lot of artillery. And this does not count that there was a five day preliminary bombardment, whereas there was no bombardment. It was a surprise operation at second harass. Uh, there were more tanks, albeit less effective than at uh, second harass, uh, but still two and a half times more tanks. Casualties for those divisions that started in the front line, 2.8 times more casualties for the British. And the advance was two and a half times larger for second arras. So in effect, Canadians advanced further, faster, with fewer casualties, uh, inflicted more damage. To, to, they destroyed nine German divisions, one elite, four uh, regular and four poor level divisions uh, with less artillery, uh, less tanks, less aircraft support. So what happened? What's the difference between first and arras, the second arras? Uh, the first is the higher tempo that the Canadians were able to conduct because of the improved infrastructure uh, and things like the tramway system, the Canadians could get enough ammunition that they could attack every day. So the Germans were in this awful position that uh, they were always on their back foot. They never got a chance to get set before another attack rolled them in, pushed them back. They didn't get a chance to get set. It's just like, you know, if you're doing uh, tug of war, if you start getting moving off your feet and don't get set, it's so much easier to pull you off your feet. Second is better weather. The picture that I showed you is some of the weather that the, you know, the British had to contend with snow, rain, sleet, all of that nonsense in April and May 1917. There was a little bit of rain in a couple of days, but it was not the kind of uh, road destroying downpours that you see in 1917. Defenders were weaker. The Germans, I think, made more command mistakes through the course of the battle than did they in 1917. Morale is somewhat lower manpower, although it's uneven because you've got units like the 91st Reserve that's essentially two companies, but then you also have full strength regiments as well. But overall, fewer manpower. And then finally, and this is to me the most important reason the attackers are just so much more effective. Canadians are better organized than were the British in 1917. Tactics are better. They're better trained. They're better able to handle the tempo of the higher. And the Canadians have this remarkable confidence. Uh, you know, coming out of 1917, they knew they were good. After Amiens, they knew they could beat anything the Germans could throw at them. And that's always uh, a major advantage. So in conclusion, what can we draw from all of this. Well, it was a major victory, but not decisive. It wasn't the full scale that Haig wanted. It would take another month to get to Cambrai, but it was still significant. I mean, causing two German armies to retreat, that's not a small scale effect. It was a surprising victory. And I think I've outlined why I think it's surprising given the limitations of Canadian manpower, the amount of artillery, the uh, just the amount of support that they had and uh, the level of defenses that they had to defeat, it's pretty surprising they had as much success as they did. It's superb. There were mistakes, there were uh, bad decisions, but overall the Canadians fought superbly. Uh, they were able to react, they were able to take daring, uh, dangerous actions that outflanked and shocked the Germans. And even when they were surprised, they were able to be sufficiently resilient to recover and defeat the Germans. And finally, it was a significant victory. And not only for a positive reason in the causing two armies to retreat, but for something that did not happen. Prior to the attack on the DQ line, uh, Douglas Haig, BFC, uh, CNC, is informed through a back channel that if he suffers heavy casualties, he's probably going to head home. So he's better be damn sure that this attack's going to work. So if the Canadian attack failed, it would have had two possible consequences. One, the Canadians would have suffered so many casualties that they would have had to take two, three, maybe four weeks to recover. Well, that would have delayed and possibly delayed further allied offensives, which would have pushed the these attacks into the time period where the weather was poor, the influenza uh, second wave pandemic was spreading across and, and debilitating units, et cetera. Uh, it could have delayed the end of the war. But the other effect is, is this could have been sufficient ammunition for Lloyd George and his political allies to displace Haig as the commander in chief. Whoever replaced Haig was sure to be given uh, or 
selected on the basis that he agreed to shut down the offensive. The thinking in London was we should wait till 1919 when we've got more tanks and more artillery and more of everything to defeat the Germans. But you consider the kind of unrest and chaos that existed in the world after the 11th of November. Can you imagine what would have happened if we had waited four or six more months? Clearly the Germans were beaten. There's nothing they could have done. But uh, in November 1918, there's revolution in Hungary and Munich and Berlin, there's street fighting in Berlin, there's uh, riots uh, throughout 1919. England is repeatedly crippled by strikes in every major industry. Soldiers go on strike. There are 13 Canadian mutinies. Can you imagine what kind of strain there would have been with another four months or five months of fighting? It could have been something that would have fundamentally altered the structure of our society as a result of the consequences of the unrest that came. That's why it was so important that the Canadians take the DQ line. With that, I will open up for questions. Thank you. Sorry, uh, everybody's muted. Let me, uh, <clears throat> if you want oh, to so ask. Make it easier. I don't have to worry as much about questions then. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, there is a, um, a button on the uh, right called reactions and it says raise your hand. If you want to do that, then I can unmute you and uh, you can ask your question. Brilliant presentation, Bill. That's good. That's what the chat is saying. Um, Thank you, Bill. Bill, I had I had a quick question to kick things off. <clears throat> My impression of of this whole period of Canadian success was that two things. One, Curry was just so much better at some of the things the British refused to do, but also that the Germans were so much weaker by this point. Is that is that fair to say? Well, I, I, I would put a little more nuance on it. I think Curry was exceptionally good at um, set piece offensives. Uh, when things started, you know, sort of uh, control goes down to the division level, he loses a bit of the plot. The court did not provide a lot of good guidance during a lot of part or many parts of this battle. So his planning, I think, is superb, but in sort of day to day, uh, things are happening all the, all the time is perhaps not quite as strong. I think a lot of the reason that Canadians had the success was in part because of the organizational changes that he implemented. The fact that the Canadians had the opportunity for two months of open warfare training, which nobody else got, uh, similar to what the German stormtroopers got, uh, you know, really made an enormous difference. The participants consistently remarked at how useful that training was. As for the Germans, I think we have to be careful. So there's, there's, there's a notion of, there's four explanations for the success of 1918, the four M's. It was manpower, it was morale, it was materiel, or was it method? So manpower, sorry, morale. Uh, the Germans basically did not fight as well as 1917. Their morale wasn't as strong. But when you go against a strong unit like the 26th Reserve Division, where they have the advantage, they're fighting to the end. And there was no question that the German machine gunners, the heart of the German defense, still fought to the end. So morale was a very sticky thing. Like if you got the jump on the Germans, their morale collapsed. But if they were in a strong position, they fought still hard. And the fact that the Canadians suffered 17, you know, over 17,000 casualties, somebody is sure fighting hard on the German side. Um, the, you know, the, the notion that, well, the Germans didn't have uh, any men left. Uh, some validity to that. You've got very weak units, but two, you know, three of the German divisions were virtually full strength. Uh, the British were not much better shape than the Germans in a lot of cases. So uh, you, you, you can't just draw a broad conclusion, well, you know, they had no manpower. You also have to take into account the Germans had so much more machine guns than they had in 1917. The Germans believed it was all because of material tanks, artillery, etc. Well, I think as I showed you in the Amiens discussion, uh, they're actually 
there were more guns, there was higher concentration of shelling at, uh, at Passion all through 1917. The density of forces, density of artillery, the number of shells fired were all significantly higher than in these battles. I think a lot of the reason is because the Canadians uh, were able to take advantage of the German weakness. It was when you applied the right method, you would win. If you tried to short circuit things, you would fail, much less what happened to the second division. And, and that was one Does of the things. Does that answer things. your question? Or? Yeah. And Curry was known for, for arguing back and saying, no, I need all the artillery I asked for. And I need to be on, uh, I need to organize this my way, not, not the British way. Yeah, and it's like for instance, on the tw the uh, he delayed the attack by one day in order to get more guns into position. Certainly, like the attack on the Canal du Nord was uh, a, a brilliant stroke. Uh, you know, Curry had to argue very hard for it. In this battle, however, he did ask Haig for more resources or for the British to take over some of his line, and Haig turned him down. So he didn't always get everything that he wanted. Uh, Bill, we have an inquiry, and uh, I think everybody would like to know um, the book. When is it available? Sorry, can you repeat when that? The, when is the book available? Uh, when is oh, that book will be hopefully out in the uh, the fall when I get a firm date. I will pass it on to Glenn, and hopefully, can pass it on to to everyone. It'll be like the the book that I did on the psalm. I'm hoping to have a second uh, map booklet. And uh, you know, much the same kind of format of analyzing the battle I went through and looked at every battalion. But one difference is that I was able to get a hold of a lot of really strong German documents, so I can have a good understanding of what Delman Singen was, uh, you know, the, the misinformation he was often operating or the intelligence he was getting was actually very poor. He thought he was fighting six six divisions through most of the battle, when at most he was facing three. It's definitely a fun, um, be fun is the wrong word, but it's an easy battle to follow with that Aras Canberra road. Just follow along the road and uh, geographically it's, it's, uh, it's user friendly uh, to understand. Yeah, it, and it's again, like most battlefields, when you walk it, it just makes such a, there's such a clarity. Like you can read, oh, it's this great observation platform. Well, when you stand on it, you go, oh, now I understand. There was another instance where there was a German counterattack where a German battalion was able to get very close to the Canadian lines without being spotted. If you look on the map, like even a fine grained map, how could that be possible? But there's just this subtle ridge line that the Canadians are on one side, the Germans were able to advance up the other and they didn't see them coming. Uh, and you can only get that when you're in the, in the battlefield. Similarly, uh, you get to the Sensei and you try walking up towards the uh, Friend Ravoy line, you can understand it's just this wide bare slope that's just a perfect uh, ground for machine gun fire to cut up the attackers. Bill, you and I were talking in the run through about uh, the fellow that I did some research on uh, who was with the the engineers and responsible for the operations of the narrow gauge uh, rail. When when I was reading through all the accounts of it, they kept talking about pushing the steelhead, uh, which was and they were they were very adept at having tracks ready to go, and they would extend them and hook up with German lines on the other side, and so they were very quick to extend their lines of communication. And uh, as you say, the, the resupply was was very good. Well, the, the, the Canadian Tramways organization was unique. The Canadian Corps was the only one that had it. In the British Army, uh, the tramways were under control of, the, uh, of each army. And there was a set limit to the amount of track that could be maintained, 200 miles across the front of the BEF. The Canadians were excluded from this limit because they were just so much more efficient. Uh, some British records suggest that they were four times more efficient for a set distance of track. So they were given the freedom to extend the line as much and as far as they wanted to. So up to a third of the engineers were devoted uh, solely to pushing the tramway uh, lines forward. And they were really critical. Without it, you would have had a lot more disjointed offensive. And the tempo was part of the reason the Germans didn't have a chance to get set and recover and get prepared for uh, the next attack. And it had also had the advantage of uh, on the return trip, they could evacuate wounded uh, much more quickly. 
Yeah, in fact, <laughs> the head of the medical service got into trouble with the uh, the uh, Brigadier General Farmar, the uh, the head of the logistics side of thing, for taking up too much, too many carts for a wound evacuation, and the you know the the director of the medical service has said, well, that's my job, you know, too bad, so sad. Um, I'm just gonna add, uh, I was just in Vizanatois a few weeks ago. Actually, that was our base for a few days. I stayed with a family there and um, quite remarkable, all the things that everybody finds in their gardens. Uh, in fact, the gentleman that we visited with, he had a Livens gas projector in his garden. Um, just on display, it's a uh, yeah. treasure trove of, uh, of artifact. And um, we had on there the St. Severa farm on the map there, uh, a friend there gave me a German beer bottle that he found there. So that was rather Bill, unique. Bill, we have a question from Steve Glover. Uh, what was going on with uh, in the air? What kind of air, air support was there for this operation? Okay, so the problem was the Canadians were advancing into a bit of a uh, salient. And so while they did not have air control, um, they, there was a lot of contention. So there were several occasions where the Germans would send over 30 to 40 aircraft and strafe uh, Canadian positions. And so there was a lot of grumbling going on about the RAF wasn't pulling its weight. And, but the problem the RAF had is they had a long front to try and control the Germans could uh, uh, could attack from basically three different sides. And so they would pick their moments to come flying in and uh, strafe the Canadians. The Germans complained that they got strafed a lot, but I'd say um, it was a lot less of a domination than say at, uh, at Amiens. Further, the, again, because of the, the salient thing, German uh, flak guns, were deployed in depth. And so you could get fired from all sorts of directions. So it was a tough battle. There was pretty heavy casualties suffered by the Air Force as a result of this. And Bill, we have a question from Sarge that I'm sure will be of interest to Patrick. Uh, did the arrival of the uh, MSA soldiers have an effect on the success of the Canadians? Absolutely. Um, as much as I'd like to, to make a joke uh, for Patrick's uh, uh, in fact, uh, without that, the Canadians would have been fighting with, much like the British were with smaller formations. Uh, and it was proven over and over again that when units started to get ground down by casualties, their effectiveness dropped, not as uh, you know, uh, on a line consistent with the, the percentage loss, but it was more like a square loss. So you have fewer men trying to do the jobs of more men. So it was absolutely imperative. So after um, MENs, uh, the Canadians suffered 11,000 casualties. Uh, almost every unit was brought back up to full strength. In some cases, even stronger than they were at MENs in time for the start of the Arras offensive. So without the conscripts, the Canadians would have been far, far less effective. So to me, that's it's a really important aspect of the, of the fighting. Great. Patrick, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I think we're reading from the same page. And thanks for the question, Serge. Um, my question, uh, I was out getting my second booster, so I missed the part of your presentation, Bill, as we discussed uh, before you started. Um, my question was that there was a, a rather robust medical system in place that gave, also gave the troops tremendous confidence that if something happened to them, that they would be as well taken care of as any soldier on the battlefield. And my own grandfather was severely wounded at Vizan Artois on the 28th of August and it would not have survived without that robust system in place. But did you comment on that during your presentation? And if not, could you comment on it now? Well, I, I can't comment so much on the medical care. What I can say is the nature of the fighting was it was more machine gun based than artillery based. The result was that the uh, dead to wounded ratio was uh, uh, I think it was uh, five to one. So uh, and Curry was certainly commented that the, so the soldiers wounded were, were able to recover quickly because a bullet wound tends to cause less damage than a shrapnel or a high explosive wound. Right. Uh, and this is very much in contrast to the Somme where the ratio was two to one. So, uh, you know,
know, when you see the 17,500 casualties, a large percentage of those are going to be able to be returned, maybe not immediately, but within a couple of weeks to a month. So, uh, and part of that was much better medical care than was available at the Somme. In part, the Canadian, the weather was better, but the Canadians were also successful. So they could recover their, uh, their wounded from the uh, field of battle, unlike the Somme, where soldiers ended up being stuck in between uh, front lines and then shelled to death. Uh, Bill Ross, uh, Ross Ferrer has a question. What were Haig's reflections on the battle afterwards? Uh, he thought it was a great victory. He was, uh, he wrote his wife saying that this was just fabulous. He came, uh, visited the Canadian Corps and uh, congratulated Watson and, uh, you know, Mc, uh, McDonnell, the commander of the first division on what a great job that they had done. And they didn't seem, he didn't seem to be all that disappointed that the Canadians had not reached all that direction. I think he probably by that point realized that he was probably asking too much of the Canadians to be able to pull off that victory. And uh, Steve Glover has another question. Um, why did the 26th uh, Battalion uh, start late uh, that morning? Uh, okay, so this is on the 27th of August. The 2nd Division was five hours after. Well, so what happened initially was is that um, the, the two division commanders met, agreed, we're going to attack at 455. Now, Lipset's smart man, he had already moved his reserve brigade because he knew from an earlier talk with Curry that there's been an attack again. So he had his reserves moving up. Burstall had that same talk with Curry, had not moved up his reserves. So when he told the 5th uh, Brigade under Tremblay that, hey, you're going to ma be making this attack, Tremblay said, I can't get there in time. And further, uh, my troops haven't seen the line and the tanks won't be, they were supposed to be supported by four tanks. So the result is they agreed that they would not attack till 10, which was a bit of a surprise to the uh, third division because they assumed they were still gonna attack on time. And uh, it didn't actually work out that well. One of the tanks broke down, the other three accomplished nothing. Two of them were knocked out. So four tanks over a 2000 meter front was not gonna accomplish much. So, uh, Really, it stemmed from Burstall not being aggressive enough in moving his reserves forward in order to make the attack. And I think that's just a reflection of just a slower kind of division. They just weren't used to working at that depot. Yeah. Uh, Robert Bell is saying a wireless is an initiative his, and he was wondering how big a role it played in communications for the Canadians. It was huge. The Canadians, uh, in fact, the second British army complained that the Canadians were getting all the latest technology wireless systems. So there was a new technology called continuous wave, don't ask me how it works, um, that uh, you know, was sort of the cutting edge of technology and the Canadians were the ones that were getting it. So Canadian field artillery brigades uh, had When the Canadians uh, moved to the Arras sector, they had to turn off all of their CW radios because the core that they were replacing did not have any. So the Canadians are uh, fielding continuous wave radios down to the field artillery brigade, whereas the 17th British Corps has none. And that had an incredibly important advantage in being able to relay information much more quickly and much more effectively than the traditional uh, wires uh, signals or old wireless systems. And we have a question from the owner of BEP iPad, who has that's, their uh, hand Mr. raised. That's Who's Mr. That? Carmichael. Ah, that's Mark. Mark, how you doing? Sorry, I, I, I have to, uh, I'm running up to go to a, a funeral, so I switched over to my iPad. Um, great, uh, great presentation. Um, one of the things that I do uh, kind of on the side, I do a lot of biographies of the 116th uh, Battalion uh, soldiers. Uh, quite a few died or killed in the attack at, um, uh, during this attack around, uh, was it Bari, uh, Notre Dame? Yeah. What I'm, I try to reimagine um, kind of the situation and the conditions, the terrain that these guys would have went through. Um, so can you tell us about the, uh, what was this, uh, was this like the actual train, uh, the train that they walked over, was it all churned up? Has it been fought over, over and over? Is it, because we always have this imagination everywhere as like the, the mud of Passchendaele or uh, uh, just around Eeps where it's just basically everything is a, is a, is a, is a churned up hell zone. 
what does so this, it, what, what were they passing over at this time? So at this time, it would have been relatively unshelled. There are some craters, uh, and I think uh, they actually ran into some problems in that they were able to, uh, they got fired on, they dropped down to the ground, uh, and the officers found it actually hard to find them because there was, uh, grasses were so high that they couldn't be mm -hmm. seen. They had to almost go up and touch them uh, individually to see where the, the troops had ended up as a result of, uh, they, were to, they were supposed to attack Bory Notre Dame, uh, after a, two, a set of two woods. So they were advancing along a, a, a pathway. Yeah, what a there and what a what a start of thing. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know they're they had very limited the way of artillery support and they, they're basically uh, they have to go to ground and there's attempts mm -hmm. to get them to restart and it just doesn't work because the Germans are uh, the Canadian shelling is is just too weak to have a, a solid effect, and so they they can't even do the isolate and annihilate because they can't even get close enough. To them. So the attack breaks down. As a result, uh, that's why uh, Lipset changes his tactics the next day and say, "Forget this broad front stuff. I'm gonna I'm just gonna kick some holes in the German line and see what happens." Excellent. Thank you. Great, um, Bill. I had there's. Uh, um, there's a drop in the questions at the moment, but I was going to ask: um, Were the British just that hidebound that they they couldn't do what the Canadians were doing, or or were they worried about the the? Uh, my impression was that they were they were fed up with the losses and the and they were getting a lot of pressure from back home to pull it back a bit. Don't don't you know destroy the army? Well, how what was the difference between the the attitudes between the two forces well okay so you have to recognize there is an enormous range in quality in british divisions so you get something like the guards division that's the equal of the canadians for the most part but they are operating with smaller divisions fewer troops a lot of cases uh tactics are really find your most your best officers and and sort of herd the mob forward while the artillery takes out the german positions so they've got an issue that, unlike the Canadians, uh, they've had pretty much every one of their divisions ground into dust. Uh, like for instance, the 51st Highland Division, a crack formation. Everyone regards the Highlanders as the equal of the Canadians. And they were in 1917. But by this point in the war, they got smashed in March. They got overrun in April. They lost two entire brigade headquarters. One was captured by the Germans. They suffered heavy, heavy casualties in the second Marne offensive. So they have to be rebuilt from scratch three times. And when they arrive uh, in the Canadian sector, they had hoped to have a month to do proper training. They're conducting individual musketry training while the Canadians have been training at the brigade and division level. So the level of training is just markedly less because they haven't had the time. They just keep getting all of their their uh, their command cadres wiped out. You know, contrast that with the 16th uh, Battalion. Every one of us platoon commanders had been with the regiment for at least since January 1918. So by August, that's eight months of experience as a platoon commander. I doubt if you had many in the 51st Highland with even eight weeks experience. So you've got this... These, these sets of, of challenges. Uh, the, the, the British certainly could have adopted the Canadian organization, but decision at the war office was we want more divisions, even if they're weaker, than fewer, stronger divisions. Because from post-war perspective, you want to have the largest army that when you get to the negotiating table, you can pound on the, we had 60 divisions. It's not as powerful as we had 30 divisions, but they're really strong. And that's the kind of thinking. So like, for instance, every British brigade went from four battalions to three. So all of their doctrine, all of the tactics, all their experience just before the March offensive, oh, by the way, you're all gonna have one less battalion. Well, that's gotta be disruptive. And Haig certainly did not want that. He wanted to close down divisions rather than close down the four battalion brigade. He was overruled. So the British, because of series of decisions, uh, there were certainly uh, a lot of the awareness of the manpower situation was appalling. Like the, the war office, or pardon me, uh, 
the ministry responsible for manpower informed the war office that in 1918, they'd get 100,000 replacements. When you think an infantry battalion, uh, you know, the usual allotment was 10% replacements per month. That means the British Army is going to shrink to nothing in no time. And so it was absolutely imperative that casualties be, uh, be uh, minimized as much as possible. Does that help answer your yeah. question? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have uh, in the chat for everybody's uh, uh, attention, um, Patrick has supplied a, a link to the Western Front Association where Bill has done some uh, presentations as well. So we just, uh, Sarge, want to draw that to your attention. Um, Thanks, Sarge. Yeah. And uh, fearless leader, where where are you? I think we should turn it back over to you now. The questions seem to have been all answered. Bill, no more questions. You answered them all. Oh, wow. Did I scare everybody? Is that it? No, I think it was just so comprehensive as usual. Way to go. Uh, Bill, I feel the need to call you uh, Dr. Stewart uh, out of respect for the remarkable research and presentation you gave us. Um, very generous with your time. And on behalf of uh, the Central Ontario branch of the Western Front Association, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Happy um, just to be able to present. Um, wonderful research. And uh, the name of the book is This Battle, the Canadian Corps and Iraq, 1918. And we'll let you know as uh, soon as it's out. Um, your last book, Canadians uh, at the Somme, uh, <laughs> is a great, another masterpiece of research material. So um, I would thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.